you go to the, there's a million seller book and you go to the store and you buy it and you get it home and you open it up and you go, hold it. I already know all these words. And music is the same way. It's just if you play, you know, a G chord and a C chord and a D chord, you've played you know, all the notes in the G scale and you already know them. So come on. <laughs> Hey everybody, Keith Billick here with another episode of the Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast. This is going to be episode six, and it features one of my favorite players of all time, so I'm really excited for you to hear that. I do have a couple items of podcast business to uh, address before we get into the interview, though. Item number one, thanks everybody for listening to the last episode, Right Hand Boot Camp. I was able to send a lot of you the tablature sheet, but for any of you who are still listening to that and have not been able to find the tab sheet or have not already emailed me, please do that and I can send it right to you. Um, you can email me at banjo. I should know my own email address. It's picky fingers banjo podcast at gmail.com and just say, Hey Keith, send me the uh, tab for right hand bootcamp and I'll send it right out to you. Second order of business, I have to give a huge thank you and shout out to a young gentleman named Peter Eckel. And the reason I am thanking Peter is because he became the very first patron of the podcast. I started a Patreon page at patreon.com, P A T R E O N dot com slash banjo podcast. And what Patreon is, it's a way for you to become a patron of the podcast by pledging a certain dollar amount so for example even one dollar per month if you pledge that amount if you think listening to this podcast is worth that and you are able to afford to support it um i thank you greatly for that it really does help um i didn't start this podcast to make money but let's face it it's not free to buy the recording equipment and it, i do take a lot of time doing this and it costs money for web hosting and and getting the podcast out there so it does help to offset the cost and although i don't want to be that guy who asks for money i guess i'm a little bit asking for money so if you're able to afford that and you think it's worth it go to patreon.com slash banjo podcast and i really appreciate it and thank you peter eckel for being the first uh patron Peter's been a listener since episode one, and we have gone back and forth on email. He's trying to figure out the best live setup for his banjo. And if he's anything like me, he might never find the best. He's going to just keep uh, trying new thing and new thing. But I always really enjoy hearing about his adventures and hearing about what he's trying. I think he's from Australia. Um, I could be completely wrong about that, but he always refers to me as mate in the emails. So I could just be being a a terrible stereotyping person here by assuming he's Australian, but um, I think that could be the case. Either way, Peter, thank you very much for your support. And the last order of business before we start the episode is just to introduce you to the guest who is Alan Mundy. And just in case you don't know who Alan Mundy is, for one thing, shame on you, but you will after listening to this. Alan Mundy is one of the most influential banjo players ever. He's a really big deal. He's one of my favorite players. I credit him for really inspiring me to play a lot of fiddle tunes in the melodic style. He has a really great melodic style of playing. I won't even try to go through his resume because I would forget a million things, but he played with Jimmy Martin, played with a band called Country Gazette, has released a whole bunch of solo albums and and other things like that. And Although I had met Alan several times in the past, I'd never really had a a good sit-down conversation with him, so I was really happy to hear him tell a lot of stories about his times with Jimmy Martin and his his early banjo years. So I'm going to quit babbling because you would rather just hear him tell you all about that instead of me. So here it is, my interview from Midwest Banjo Camp featuring Alan Mundy. I'm from Norman, Oklahoma, and I've got two older brothers and a younger sister. And uh, early on, my actually, my oldest brother played the accordion for a length of time. And then my younger sister got into it, and uh, 
the lady, this is back in the day when the teacher would actually come to the house. The door-to-door salesman, yeah. Right, and she was a college student, the teacher was. Uh, Nancy Carter was her name, and she was the former either runner-up or Miss Oklahoma or something. But she would come over and give my sister lessons, and then after my sister took a lesson, then she would show me what she learned, so I would kind of fool around on the accordion some. So I had this interest in music, and we had... My parents had recordings around the house, and this is back in the day when an album was a collection of several 78s. Okay, more you know, of a compilation style. Well, it it was a, you know, you would have uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony or something, and it would take mm. six 78s yeah. uh, or more probably to do something like that. So we had a those, and I would listen to Strauss waltzes and those sorts of things, and uh maybe a recording of a musical My Fair Lady or some such, and uh, would listen to those. And then my oldest brother came home from the Navy with a guitar and a record on how to play it, Pete Seeger's Folk Singer's Guitar Guide. All right. And uh, I would listen to that. You know, it was a recording, and there it was. And, man, I really liked the sound of the guitar, so I would got his guitar and would work on it. He went off to college and uh, got married and one thing and another, and— I sort of took over the guitar. Inherited it, yeah. Played the guitar, got a better one. Uh, I remember I bought it. Uh, I'm Like I said, I'm from Norman, Oklahoma, and uh, all my dad's connections were folks that had been in World War II and through the American Legion. So he had a friend that had a TV repair shop that sold guitars. So I bought my first guitar, which was a K. I think it was $40, and I paid out $5 a month. I signed a little white card yeah, uh, and would go down every month and pay my five dollars until it got paid off. A little K K arch top, right? So I was probably fourteen or so. Yeah, that's time. what I was just gonna ask. So, you, so you were playing, uh, or not banjo yet, but you have played banjo and accordion in your life. Uh, yeah, all you need to yeah. do is add some bagpipes, and <laughs> right, you'd just right. be the most hated musician yeah, of yeah. all time. Give me a, some spoons and <laughs> <laughs> exactly. so right. Uh, so it sounds like mostly classical music is what you were exposed to? That was but. early on. But, you know, in the late 50s uh, was a big folk music revival. Sure. And so they were, all these groups were on TV playing guitar, and uh, I liked the sound of that. And among that was a banjo, you know. And, and uh, actually, I went down to buy a record of Pete Seeger because I thought he was a guitar player, and it turns out he's a banjo player also. Yeah. Uh, so I liked that, and so I got a banjo. Was it a long neck like Seeger played? Oh, gosh, you... no, no. Okay. I couldn't afford anything that like that. It was uh, the cheapest, I should say the least expensive banjo that Vega made, which was called a Vega Ranger. Okay. And I don't have that banjo, but I've got one just like it that a friend of mine gave me. So I have a Vega Ranger at home and uh, learned to play on that. I got the Pete Seeger book on... How to Play the Banjo, and uh, I had ordered my banjo, and I had the book, and I would read the book. I would read it four or five times by the time I got the banjo, and so in a sense, I almost the first time I played banjo, I could play it because I had read the book. I played guitar a little bit. You were uh, ready for it. I was ready, yeah, and yeah, I would practice cool. that basic strum on the side of my desk at school, and... Uh, so I was ready for it, and literally the first time I picked up my banjo, got it in tune, uh, I, I played something on it. I it mean, actually sounded okay. Yeah, it did to me. It was a real thrill. I loved it. And uh, so I sort of switched from the being thinking of myself as a guitar player to wanting to play the banjo mostly. And So I started searching out people locally that knew how to play, and I found a few uh and a friend of mine had given me, his name's Gary McNabb. I haven't seen him in many, many, many years. But he gave me for Christmas the Flat and Scruggs Foggy Mountain Banjo record. Uh-oh. And then it was all over. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's, it's, was, it's real interesting. And I think Pete Wernick mentioned this, uh, that you hear that playing, and I truly thought it was miraculous. Mm-hmm. I couldn't imagine how it was done. But somehow in all that, I had a sense that I could do it, you know, that people did that. Yeah. And so I started searching out people that knew how to do that sort of thing and finally found a 
a guy in Oklahoma City named Gary Price, who's a name that uh, some banjo players might know because he makes a tailpiece sure. called the Price, and he makes a Price tailpiece, and he makes a a case, and has been involved in the music for a long time. Again, I haven't seen him in many many years, but I took I went. My dad worked in Oklahoma City on. on Back in the olden days, uh, people worked till Saturday noon. Okay. And so he had to work on Saturday morning, so I would ride to Oklahoma City with him, and uh, he would drop me off at Gary Price's, and I'd take a lesson, and then he'd come back and pick me up. So was Gary McNabb, he he was not a bluegrass-style player? He, no, no. He was okay. just a friend well, but, that knew I played banjo okay. and, and knew this was banjo playing, and so he gave it to me. He wasn't... Uh, you know, especially into the music or anything. He was just a friend. Yeah. So once you met Gary Price, though, he he had a three-finger style and could do some of the Scruggs. Oh, right. Definitely, definitely. Uh, you know, and in Oklahoma City, the Dillards used to uh, are from Missouri, and the first time they went to California, they came through Oklahoma City and played a place called the Budai. Uh, and I didn't see them there, but uh, Gary had seen them there, so he yeah. was— familiar with the Dillards. And <clears throat> then I, you know, in my playings, like I say, I found Gary and he showed me, I think, a couple of lessons. And it was, a, once again, it was kind of all I needed in the in a sense because he showed me how the role worked and how yeah. roles are organized. And uh, so I sort of got it. You know, in that playing that Pete Seeger style, you know, the just the basic strum, uh, it's too bad that people... Banjo players uh, who are just beginning uh, and want to play in the three-fingered bluegrass way, I know you're itching to do it, but in some ways it's it's really instructive and revealing uh, to play in that Pete Seeger way uh, because right away what it does is it puts the melody and the rhythm and the harmony all together in one package that's really understandable. You can play it for people. It sounds good. It sounds like what it is. Uh, and where bluegrass is, the three-fingered roll style sort of takes that all apart and does it in little bits and pieces yeah. to where it's you need... Uh, that's why it works so well in a band is because it you need that context of a band to kind of explain what you're doing uh, and stripping it down to the Seeger style might reduce the temptation to just play as fast as you can all the time at the expense of maybe accenting the melody notes or with proper timing, right? all that kind of thing right. that a lot of people do. Well, you know, if uh, in a sense what's happening in the Scruggs style, and I, I've got my picks on right now, but uh, if you do, if you wanted to do this... <laughs> You know, what you're doing is you're, you have sort of an emphasis on this. Yeah. And then you're playing this, the strum, as a chord. Uh, but when, uh, when you do the picking, you take that all apart. And rather than having the chord sort of in a, in a vertical line, uh, if it were on a musical staff, you take that, the same exact notes and you just lay them out. You know, you take them apart. So now, mm -hmm. and you would do this. Mm -hmm. And it's all the same notes, and you're doing the same thing in a sense. But rather than... You're doing... Yeah. So uh, it really helps you get a, founded in what you're doing to where when you start taking it all apart, you can still, still hear it as a whole. There are a lot more things that can go wrong right away when you, <laughs> right. when you take it all apart. Right. And the other thing about the... the I'm not in very good tune here. The other thing about the Scrug style is uh, it's like a movie, a film, that a film is just a bunch of stills. Sure. And then you get it going fast enough, and it, it only simulates movement. Right. It's not really movement. It's yeah. just a bunch of it's stills. It's perceived. Right. Well, in bl bluegrass, is, banjo is kind of the same way. It's just a bunch of notes, single notes, until you get it going fast enough 
to where it, it sounds like it's supposed to sound. And that's sort of a challenge. That's a really cool analogy. I've never heard that before, but that makes a lot of sense. People can't hear it when they try to play slow. This isn't, I know. This isn't what I'm supposed to be doing at all. But um. You know, it's, all, it's like this. What did you learn at camp this week? And, well, I learned this. You know, and you yeah. go, what is that? Doesn't you sound go, like well, anything. it's Foggy Mountain Breakdown. Can't <laughs> you hear it? Yeah. Those are the right notes. <laughs> yeah, you are. You're playing all the right notes. It's just you have to get it up to a tempo to where it makes sense. Mm -hmm. And that is a challenge for sure. Right. But once it's up to tempo, if you don't have that foundation that maybe the Seeger style or solid timing gives you. Then, right, um, right. And also that. Then the movie is out of focus or I don't know what the yeah, analogy yeah, would be for it, that. Exactly. And the other thing is in the Seeger style, you have a real definite place where the melody is. You know, the, in the book it was. That's almost literally from the Pete Seeger book. And so it gives you a sense of melody. And a lot of times people will ask, when you're playing in the Scruggs style, do you emphasize uh, the melody, you know, as you play? Are you playing the melody notes harder or louder? And in a, I would guess the answer is probably yes. But it's not from a conscience, conscious uh, sense of, oh, play harder with the index finger, play harder with the middle finger, because it all goes by so fast. Yeah, you couldn't possibly think of all that. So what you, you have, if you do the Pete Seeger thing first, is you have a real sense of the melody and of the idea of, you know, where it is and what you want to hear to where and your brain and your ear and your muscles all sort of take over and you just sort of do it because that's what you're wanting to hear. It's more like singing than actually picking out all these 16th notes. Exactly, exactly. And you and you develop a sense of, in a way, of which notes are the important notes, which notes are the filler, rhythmic filler notes. Mm -hmm. And it's, it turns out to be more of a feel or a touch than an actual sort of conscious... Loud, soft, soft, loud, yeah, loud, loud. Yeah, yeah, right, right. right. And because it can change, you know, just in one finger, one from one finger to the next, sure. next note in the sequence, they, most may, may, they both may be the melody and then the rest are not, or maybe it's one and then none of the others are till the next measure. So, you know, it's just you develop this sensibility about it and it comes from playing a lot and listening a lot. And playing along, I think that's one thing. I don't know if people do it as much as you used to, but, you know, I've listened to a lot of the very fine banjo players, and one comes to mind is Alan Shelton. Sure. You know, uh, listening to recordings and uh, playing along, and uh, a lot of my learning was spent playing along with records. Yeah. And uh, I know people say, well, they're too fast, and I, or I don't know it, or this or that or the other. Well, I didn't either, you know. And I remember the first thing, this is the first thing I could play along with, and it was this. And that was it. Yep. That was all I could do. But that's a big breakthrough. But every time it would come around, <laughs> I would ready. do that, <laughs> you know. And... Uh, were you slowing down records to, to learn them, or did you just have uh, to be really patient? No, eventually I did. Somebody told me, you know, that you can turn on the turntables. You know, you had uh, 33 and a third, and then you mm -hmm. had 16, I think, was the other Oh, you actually speed. had a setting for 16. Yeah. I've so, heard people put a nickel on the stylus, too. Is that a thing that you tried? I, the only reason I would have done that is because my it would skip. Oh, yeah, And right. you would put... A, Keep Some, it in place. Yeah, to just to keep it in place. Of course, it, and I remember when I got a the record player I had would always skip on the first track, you know, about halfway into the first track. Mm -hmm. And I just let it do it and, and would listen to And I finally got a record player that didn't do that. And it was like having a whole new record collection because <laughs> <laughs> I could hear the first half of all the first 
tracks on both sides. Oh, my God. That's funny. Yeah. Oh, it is. Dis- it was, rediscovering everything. Right, right. And uh, But I would slow them down. Of course, at the time, that would cut the pitch, you know, down. An octave. An octave. Yeah. But still, you know, especially Earl Scruggs, it was so good to listen to him at that speed, you know, because it allowed you to kind of, I won't say hear in between the notes necessarily, but you could hear just little slides and yeah, finger noises that right to, and yeah. just the precision of the roll mm-hmm. and the emphasis of maybe a hammer on or a slide or something just a lot a lot of things are revealed when you slow them down and it would be like you know looking at a big Rembrandt, you know, wall size Rembrandt, and you just go over and look at one little detail of yeah. it, and you wow, wow, look at that boot, right through you a know, magnifying glass or yeah, something. Yeah, and, and he's even got the laces on it, you know, just and you see a lot of things and hear a lot of things that you wouldn't hear otherwise. And nowadays, digitally, you can slow things down and keep the the pitch the same, which is good. But I kind of enjoyed, you know, the grumble. It's it's what you had, so you, you made the most of it, oh, it sounds yeah. like. I had a, a faculty, I taught at South Plains College mm-hmm. that had a music program, and our director, he would always go over and talk to, uh, you know, being a community college, they took in a lot of what they called pioneer students, which were the, for maybe in a family, the first student to ever go to college. Oh. Yeah. And so they would offer a lot, you know, make sure they had a lot of help. And he would go over and talk to them about just desire and ambition. And his ambition was to play guitar. And uh, he was even a little older than I am. And he would do this thing where he had a little record player and he would put it on the floor. And he would take his shoe and sock off. And he would put his foot on the record. <laughs> and drag it with and his drag toe. It, yeah, <laughs> just to hear. I mean, and that's, you know, when you want something, those are the kinds of things you figure out yeah. to do to get it. Necessity, the mother of invention. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, now we have the amazing slow downer and all this yep. sort of stuff. And uh, so it's when you want to do it and it, it really gets to you. You know, it, it does. I had a friend. Who wanted to play? Learn to play the banjo a little bit, mm-hmm. <laughs> only a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit. She was a docent on a a barge, uh, the C and O Canal in Washington D.C., and she thought it'd be cool if she could play, you know, the banjo for a couple of tunes, just because they dress. It was uh, entertain folks, and it was hauled down the river by mules. Oh, or down the canal, I should say. And so they dressed up in in costume of the time, and she thought it'd be cool to play a banjo yeah. for the crowd. And I said, well, uh, I'll help you learn, but I, I'll warn you, there is no playing a little. I said, you'll get a banjo, and that'll be good enough, and you'll play, and you'll learn something, and you'll go, you know, I think I it's could play fun. better if yeah. I had a little better banjo, and you're going to be hanging around music stores and Stopping by on the way home and looking to see what they've got. And you were right? Oh, gosh, yeah, yeah. She's, nice. I mean, this is 20, 30 years ago, and she's still playing, going to jam sessions. That's great. You know, yeah, it was real cool how it worked out, but it, it's not something you can take lightly. No, you once once you find it, you're all in once you've been bitten. Yeah, you know, my wife is a quilter, and there's quilts are the same way, you know, you get in and you just want to do a little bit, and then you find there's this whole world yeah. Of quilting and art, the art of it all and uh, the history of it and and the material and the machines and, yeah. you know, it's pretty soon you're... Feels good to be learning things oh, and gosh, yeah. seeing your progress. Right, right, right. And it's, you know, it's a good way to spend your life, I think, you mm-hmm. know, involved in those sorts of things. So it sounds like, obviously, you were learning a lot of that Earl Scruggs stuff, a, a big part of your playing that influenced me is your melodic playing. When did you and how did you figure that stuff out? Well, uh, like everybody else, you know, I'm in my home listening to the radio and I hear this, there's a folk music show and they play this recording of Bill Monroe doing Devil's Dream. Mm -hmm. And it's Bill Keith on the banjo I learned and he's got this way of, and you know, I, I came, I found a note or two of it, but I didn't I tried to make everything work in in the roles I could conceive of at the time, 
and it wasn't working. And I can't remember where it was that somebody said, oh, you do it like this, or you, you know, it's this thing. Uh, but anyway, it was through Bill Keith for sure. And uh, I had a, the guy that really, 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 really taught me to play and showed me how to play and that I really admired was a guy named Eddie Shelton, who uh, there's a famous banjo player named Alan Shelton, mm-hmm. no relation. No relation, okay. And uh, Eddie uh, worked for, uh, what was it called? I forget, but it was a cash register company. And uh, he traveled over the country some good bit, and, and he played real well. And I met him through Byron Berline, who is a fiddle player at the sure. That I met at the University of Oklahoma. He and I are great buddies and uh, hung together our time together at OU. And he introduced me to Eddie Shelton, and uh, who was living in Oklahoma City uh, working for this cash register company as a repair person. And uh, he had, between he and Byron, they had back then reel to reel tapes of some live Bill Monroe shows that had mm-hmm. Bill Keith as a banjo, which was a real eye-opener. And he sort of clued me in as to how all that was working. So so what did he show you? Just the, the basic, like a scale I don't even shape th- pattern? I, or I don't even think it was a scale. I mean, he didn't say, here's, here's a way to play the scale doing that. He just went right straight to the tune, you know. Know, and so on, mm-hmm. and said, put your fingers here and do this, and that, there it is. And sort of, you you know, you figure out, well, that's it's just scales, you know, right. ultimately. And if you can play scales in that fashion, then melodies are just different jumblings of the, uh, of the scale. Different combinations, right? right? Yeah. You know, and I always, this is sort of stupid in a way, but I, people never think of this, but you know, if you if music, you take the scale and you just all a lot of the music we hear are just different combinations of scales yeah. and spaces. And you go, well, language is the same thing. It's these letters jump clump together, and then spaces in between them. And so that music is kind of a like language in that way. Very much so. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if people ever do this, but I think it's funny to think about. Is you go to the, there's a million seller book. And you go to the store and you buy it and you get it home and you open it up and you go, hold it. I already know all these words. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and music is the same way. It's just if you play, you know, a G chord and a C chord and a D chord, you've played you know, all the notes yep. in the G scale and you already you already know them. So come on. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so it's sort of like that. You just sort of start discovering things, and uh, we would, Eddie and I would, I'd go up and visit him and literally sit out in his garage and go to sleep out there, you know, all night, wake up the next morning and start playing again. And it, you know, in music, it sort of helps if you have a situation where you can do that for some part of your time as to where you're just totally, totally into it. Yeah, how much were you practicing back then? Well, I have no idea. I always say you should ask my mother. (laughs) Were you, so that's how you learned the melodic style. As far as your bluegrass playing was concerned, were you coming along pretty well by then? Were you playing out in bands? Yeah, I tried to find anybody I could find to play with, you know, and, and... being from Norman, Oklahoma, that's not exactly the center of it all. But there yeah. was a lot of music, but it was a lot of different kinds. And there was a lot of uh, Western Western swing. And I played, uh, I used to go play with a, a, a lady who was a hairdresser. She played piano. And a guy at the church I went to who had a, a cleaners, worked at a cleaners, and he played fiddle. And we would do bubbles in my beer, you know, in the key of F. And I would try to clomp along and play as whatever it is I could think of to play. And so I'd play with them, and I played. uh, There was a really fine uh, guitar player that I knew because I bought my banjo from him because he had a music store named Mike Ritchie, who went on to become a character named Slim Ritchie, and a very, very fine jazz guitarist. And uh, I'd hang out at his store there in Norman, 
and learned a lot just from people passing through. There was a, I played at a little place while I was in college called West Town. There was a barbecue beer joint, but it was run by a guy named Max Salathiel. No, it wasn't Max. It was Doyle Salathiel. Mm-hmm. And Doyle had been a jazz guitarist in New York City at the time, you know, that Tal Farlow was there and Jimmy Rainey and all these famous players. But he, you know, came back to Oklahoma and his brother was a, had a Western swing band called, changed his name to uh, Lindsey, Merle Lindsey. And I forget what his band was called, but I would play at this West Town and Merle, this Doyle Salathiel would play some. And he would always team me with some Western swing guy that would do, you know, six pack to go, give me a six pack to go. And so we'd do just country music, guy on the guitar and me on the banjo. And he never said, you know, banjo doesn't go with this. Back then, you just jumped in there and tried to play what you could. Yeah, and there wasn't too many examples of what you should have even been doing. You could <laughs> you could try to fit your roll patterns in there somewhere if you right, want. But right, uh, or chord stuff. Or, right. uh, you know, Alan Shelton had a few little sort of steel guitar kinds of things that he did on the banjo, and I would emulate some of those and try to make things work. And And that's when I started getting into, you know, trying to do... You know, sort of chordal chord melody, chord melody kinds of things, and so it all kind of goes together. But I always wanted to do the bluegrass stuff. I mean, that's what I liked and would have loved to have played. And there were some players around that did that, and I would do my best to, uh, you know, copy the solos on the recordings as much as I could. Which is another important thing, you know, in a in development is trying to copy solos. Mm-hmm. So. Somehow or another, you found your way into Jimmy Martin's band, so you must have progressed quite a bit after those initial days of learning. Well, I hope so, and that's a long story, but I had met Sam Bush and Wayne Stewart while I was still in college. Sam was 16 years old, and I was 20 by then, Okay, and uh, we had this idea of getting a band together Uh, called Poor Richard's Almanac. Mm -hmm. So when I graduated from college, I moved to actually Hopkinsville, Kentucky, which is where Wayne Stewart lived. Okay. And and we tried to get a few gigs here and there, and without going into it, we went out to Oregon and played a gig out there. But then I almost immediately got drafted, so I had to leave and uh, went back to Oklahoma. It was turned down by the draft, thank you, and uh, in 1969... And uh, then recorded with, a, here we are again, you know, just uh, there was a guy there named Harlow Wilcox who played guitar and really sort of primitive, low-level, sort of Dwayne Eddy-ish mm-hmm. ish kinds of things. And he had had a hit, uh, believe it or not, with a tune called Moose Trot and, okay. and won a BMI award. And so they needed an album to go with it. So... I got a call to come down and play banjo on this seemingly, they said, oh, it's, it's a great bluegrass tune. Well, it wasn't at all, you know, but I played something on this, on this tune, and it was called Moose Trot. So it became the B-side of this. Of the big hit. Of the big hit. And uh, when they put it out uh, as a single. So what? Where am I now? So, oh, they were going to go to Nashville to try to promote Harlow Wilcox. Okay. And wanted me to go along and said, would you like to go along? Sure. I called up Wayne Stewart and they drove down from Kentucky. Sam and Wayne drove down and we met at the time, it was in the Noel, N-O-E-L, hotel, which was just up the hill from the Grand Ole Opry house. And I'm going to say it's Tut Taylor, but I don't know who did it. But somebody rented like the third floor. and Of the it, Noel? Yeah, of the Noel Hotel. And this is during what's called, the, at the time, the DJ convention, okay. where the DJs and the artists would get together. But as it turns out, a lot of fans were 
rolled in then too. Well, the bluegrassers of that bunch would get together at the Noel Hotel. And uh, it was there that I met, or I didn't meet him, I knew uh, Al Osteen, who died just a couple years ago. And Al was playing banjo with Jim and Jesse, and I had met him at Bill Monroe's first bluegrass festival, or second, I can't remember. And he said, you know, I'm playing with Jim and Jesse, and the banjo player for Jimmy Martin is leaving, and Jimmy's going to come up here after a while. I'll introduce you, and uh, you can try out. And, I, you know, back then, if you wanted to be a banjo and player in bluegrass, for me in Oklahoma, the only, as I looked out, you know, Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs, they don't hire banjo players. Yeah, that job's taken. Yeah, the Osborne brothers, nope. <laughs> right. Reno and Smiley, nope. But Stanley Bill Mon- brothers, nope. nope. Yeah. But Bill Monroe hires banjo players. Jim and Jesse hires banjo players. And Jimmy Martin hires banjo players. Okay. And Jimmy was looking for a banjo player. So uh, Al introduced me. Uh, I spoke with him. And uh, Doyle Lawson was in his band at that moment. And I had met Doyle when I was... That little brief period I was in Kentucky, Wayne and I went up to hear J.D. Crow at, in uh, Lexington play at the Holiday Inn, mm-hmm. which is a, sort of a famous moment in bluegrass. Yeah. Uh, and with Red Allen on the guitar. And they were really, I mean, it was fantastic. But anyway, I had met Doyle there, and Doyle was in Jimmy's band. And if Jimmy didn't hire a banjo player, Doyle was going to play banjo, and he didn't want to do that. <laughs> And he's a very good banjo player. Yeah, I and, believe it. And had actually played banjo with Jimmy some years before this. So he didn't want to do it. So he helped me, and he talked to Jimmy and said, hire him, and I'll work with him. So Doyle and I, I got the job, live with Doyle. And you have reached the end of this episode, but fear not, that is actually only half of the conversation with Alan Mundy. Part two of that conversation will be coming up on the next episode, probably in about a week or so. So in the meantime, feel free to email me with any questions or comments. That email address is pickyfingersbanjopodcast at gmail.com. And just a reminder, if you want to become a supporter of the show, you can go to patreon.com slash banjo podcast so that does it for me and join me on the next episode for the rest of the combo with alan mundy <laughs>